1997, the, the um, uh, Asian currency started to devalue. Um, uh, Asian markets started to go down. The, Russians, uh, the, Russian bond, the Russian government had a huge debt burden. It was rolling on a three-month basis with hedge funds and, and rich guys. And um, they couldn't roll it over. Russia defaulted, devalued. The stock market went down 88%. My one billion went down to 100 million. <clears throat> there was no more yachts invitations after that. <laughs> but then I discovered something far more um, disturbing than losing 90% of your money which was that the, the, the companies that I invested in, which were basically oil and gas companies in Russia, were run by people who, you've now, um, who are now sort of properly immortalized, uh, uh, the Russian oligarchs. These, these a small group of about 22 guys basically owned a majority of all these companies. And they used to behave themselves a little bit when they thought they, had a, they, they, they needed access to Western capital, when the Western capital markets were open. But after the Russian um, economy defaulted and devalued and everything went uh, to hell, um, there was no more Western investors in any case. And so they no longer had any need to um, behave themselves. And so in 1998 and 1999, the Russian oligarchs embarked on an orgy of stealing that's been unprecedented in the history of business. I mean, it's just remarkable. Every type of scam you could ever imagine they were trying to do. Asset stripping, transfer pricing, dilution, embezzlement, you name it, they were doing it. And I was owning one or two percent of these companies and just watching all the money that the companies had just disappearing. And so I had to decide something. I either, either was going to stay there and just put up with all this stuff, or I was going to have to, um, uh, uh, I mean, well, I mean ba basically, there, there, was, there, was, there was really only two choices. You could either leave or you could fight. I mean, I, I, I could not just watch it happen. And so we decided to fight. And, um, and the most famous fight um, involved Gazprom. And uh, Gazprom is a company that no one had really heard of in the West um, until like 10 years ago. But, uh, and Gazprom, um, is, it's the biggest gas company in the world. It's about 10 times the size of Exxon in terms of um, uh, hydrocarbon reserves. And Gazprom, in 1999, was trading at a 99.7% discount to BP or Exxon per barrel of hydrocarbon reserves. Why, why was it at such a big discount? Because everybody thought that everything, that everything was being stolen out of Gazprom. So I looked at this thing and I said to myself, could they really be stealing everything out of Gazprom? That would be just the most remarkable thing, a company 10 times the size of Exxon, everything being stolen. So I got together with my um, team and I said, let's do a stealing analysis of Gazprom. And they looked at me, how do you do a stealing analysis? So, <laughs> So we, th we started thinking, well, how do you do a stealing analysis? And, and uh, as I said <laughs> in the introduction, um, they, don't, they didn't teach me this at Stanford Business School. Um, you couldn't go to the company and say how much he's stealing. <laughs> um, because they wouldn't tell you. <laughs> that might do worse things. You couldn't go to the brokers because the brokers are so busy preening themselves in front of Gazprom to get co corporate finance work that the last thing they would do is tell anybody how much stealing was going on. Um, but I learned something as a consultant at the Boston Consulting Group, which is um, if you want to find out the answer to something which is not written down somewhere, you just go and interview people. That's what the consultants do, for any of you who are thinking about consulting. And um, so I said, let's make a list of all the people who know about stealing a gas problem and just ask them to breakfast, lunch, dinner, tea, coffee, and see what we can learn from interviewing them. We didn't know whether anyone would accept our invitations or tell us anything, but why not try? So we set up about 40 of these meals. And most people accepted the invitation. Why not? And we discovered something very interesting, is that in the communist days, the richest person in Russia was maybe 10 times richer than the poorest person. But by 1999, the richest person in Russia was like 250,000 times richer than the poorest person. And that just poisoned the whole environment of the country. Everyone just hated everybody else and hated the rich people and hated the people that stole. And so people were, in these meetings, were spilling their guts out to us about all the different scams they knew about. We were filling up notebooks with all these different allegations of scams. It was interesting, really interesting stuff that people were telling us, writing it all down. We filled up a whole notebook with these allegations. But how do you know any that this stuff is true? You know, a lot of sour grapes. Now, Russia has one other great um, interesting anomaly, which is it's got to be the most bureaucratic country in the world. 
everything that ever happens in Russia gets filed and quadruplicated in four different ministries. And you go to the bathroom, you have to write down, and then some ministry like um, registers it. And so, and, and what's interesting is that you can just go and ask for the information. It's just a question of like going to the ministry. And so one of my guys, one of the, uh, one of the guys who works for me, my head of research, started going around to different ministries, picking up databases on different things. And we were able to take these databases we got from the ministries <coughs> and cross-reference them with all the stuff we learned in these breakfast, lunches, and dinners. And we learned exactly how much had been stolen from Gazprom, by who, in what way. And basically, what we learned um, was that nine individuals from management of Gazprom had stolen um, an oil company the size of Exxon out of Gazprom. That's pretty dramatic. I mean, well, it's the size of Kuwait. The oil reserves the size of Kuwait had been stolen out of Gazprom. Um, but we also um, learned that um, uh, the oil company the size of, of Kuwait is, is only 9% of Gazprom's reserves. 91% was still there. So what do you do if the market's pricing something as if there's a 99.7% discount and um, you just discovered uh, that really there should only be a 10% discount? You go and buy the hell out of the thing. And that's what we did. We made Gazprom our single largest investment. That's usually where a fund manager would stop. But we said to ourselves, this is just so morally outrageous what these guys have done, and it's so obvious. Let's share this information with the world. <laughs> <laughs> and so we did. Um, we, we broke it into seven chapters. I gave a chapter to the Financial Times, a chapter to the Wall Street Journal, a chapter to the New York Times, Business Week. And each of them wrote a story. And boy, did that set the M Moscow night on fire. 